a lot of people that I've spoken to in the BDSM community stress that despite, you know, public perception, um, that the dom is the one who holds all the power. They say that the submissive is the one who actually holds all the power. Could you explain what that might mean? So that's a contentious statement, I think, in the kink world, because I know just I, I know kinky people who say that. I know just as many people, especially on the submissive side, they get really frustrated with that because mm -hmm. the idea that they're the one that secretly holds the power is antithetical to what they want as a submissive. They want to give that up. <laughs> the best the best answer to that that I have ever found actually comes um, from Janet Hardy and Dossie Easton. Uh, Janet Hardy wrote The Ethical Slut. And together, she and Dossie Easton have written several books of the years, written, not written, I apologize. <laughs> but one of them is uh, the New Bottoming book. And in the New Bottoming book, they talk about the idea of power exchange, especially, you know, differentiating it from abuse. And they say that the idea behind power exchange is that somebody has to have power in order to give it up. Mm. that in an abusive situation, you don't have power. You can't stop it. You can't control it. They don't want feedback on how they're treating you. But in a power exchange relation, the submissive person has power. They have personal authority. They have their own autonomy, their own agency, and they are choosing to give that over to their partner. And that I think is the most accurate description I've ever heard. It's not that the submissive person is secretly the one in control, which I think a lot of my DS couples find very uncomfortable. The submissive wants their dominant to be in control and the dominant is not necessarily okay with the idea that they're just being patted on the head and led to believe that they hold authority. They <laughs> Here you go, here's a whip, go ahead. <laughs> exactly. <Good boy. laughs> so, I mean, from an, from an outside perspective, if we're trying to explain that power exchange in a way that feels safe for vanilla people, I can understand why folks say what they do. But mm -hmm. the more accurate answer is that both partners hold power in the relationship and the submissive is choosing to give some of theirs over to their dominant. I've also spoken to a lot of people who you know, doms who say that a lot of their clients who choose to be submissive are often people who hold, you know, powerful positions in everyday society, CEOs, presidents, et cetera, stuff like that, politicians. Why do you think that people who are such powerful people in their everyday life would choose to flip the switch in their sexual lives? See, this is what's really interesting because I've heard those same um, sort of anecdotal reports from pro doms. And it's interesting to me academically because that doesn't actually align with the research. And I think that there, there might be a difference between the people who visit professional doms versus the people that practice kink in their everyday lives. Because when researchers have studied the kink community, they have found that people that are dominant tend to be dominant across all their life domains. And people that are submissive tend to feel submissive across all of their life domains. The idea that you know the powerful CEO is the one most likely to be submissive in other areas is a really popular pop culture trope again. And it's one that we hear a lot about when we're talking to professional kinksters who are getting paid for their service. And that makes sense to me because they are perhaps seeing a population that's choosing a specific moment, a specific experience for a specific cathartic reason. But I suspect that those same clients are not necessarily going home and having their partner as their authority holder in other aspects of their relationship. I think that those anecdotal stories versus sort of where the what the researchers find is more showing us a difference in uh, the kink community, the kink consumer versus the kink lifestyler. Mm. Um, but that's just sort of where my head's been at as I've parsed out the various research over my books and my projects, because I don't know that I can say that there's um, been studies that will back up my theory, but that that's where I'm at on it, because it is really interesting that the research consistently disproves the much more commonly heard anecdotal stories like you just shared. I wonder if it's true also that these, you know, powerful people are the kind of people who can afford to hire a pro dom to fulfill those fantasies, right? Whereas, you know, somebody who wasn't holding such a powerful position that earned them so much money wouldn't be in, you know, an economically viable situation to hire 
a sex worker. That's another really great explanation. And that's part of why I find the the sort of sociological research and the psychological research side of kink so fascinating because there are so many myths and misconceptions around this community that because we hear enough anecdotes, we accept as truth. And when that happens in my world as a clinician, that can be really problematic because that leads my colleagues to think that they know who their clients are before their clients ever have a chance to tell them about their lives and their experiences. Yeah, that's a really good point. Hey guys, if you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q and A's, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates.